Lauren, I'm going to start with you first. Um, uh, you know, great, great presentation there. Is it too early for AI? You know, we're talking about developing strategies. So why now? Because some people could argue a lot of this is just, it's really machine learning, not AI. And, and we see, I had a great conversation actually when I was with Amdocs and uh, we, we did some work with you and, and Microsoft was there. And he said, is this stuff's not really AI and it's too early for AI strategies. So what would you say uh, with response to that? Uh, so the best way of understanding this is understanding what AI is. Because if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different answers of what AI is. <laughs> so AI is a collection of different technologies. But I think if you, if you put the technologies to the side, if you look at the problems that AI solves rather than the technologies, I think it's a better way of looking at it, which is they normally fall into three areas. One is around prediction, the second is pattern detection, and the third is automation. So if you address AI in, in those three spheres, then you'll have a better understanding. And machine learning, in my opinion, is certainly AI. Uh, yes, it's not deep neural networks and other things that happen in, in the future. Um, so machine learning is still a, it's a more of a realistic application that's available today. So yeah, you're right, you can wait five years, uh, and by which point you're going to seriously lag behind the competition. I don't think service providers or any organization, any industry can wait, can afford to wait. Uh, I think they have to start, at least start developing a strategy, understand the value of AI for your business. Again, let's put technology to the side for the time being and look at the value that it can bring to your business, understanding what problems can it solve, whether it's in customer experience, whether it's in the network, forward management, whatever the area of the business it can solve, look at building a strategy now, uh, and then the technology will come That's shortly after. What do you think? Do you think now, now's the so, time? So, yeah, I mean, I, I'll kind of uh, add on the technology piece of it. Uh, when you look at, you know, what Amazon, Google, uh, Facebooks are doing, you know, now it is going more away from being an art to something that you can just you know throw your data in you know get your models automated tune and with a press of a button have a real life system uh, up there and ready uh, and agreeing with him it's like you know get your data ready uh, you know because at some point it's going to uh, you are going to need it uh, for whatever applications you want to do uh, but get started with it and Brian we heard you know earlier you know you brought it there again such about data um, how much of a problem is it for telcos right now, you know, the data problem, and, and, and how can we solve that and, and make them more ready? Yes, good, very good question. Um, let, me, let me start, though, with just setting the scene before I answer your question, though. And that is that um, many people believe that AI represents a, a, a new age. That we're actually, you know, we, we had the age of steam, we had industrialization. And AI, we, we talk very parochially in our industry about AI. We talked about the network concepts, you know. There's all sorts of other areas that AI is being applied to. It's a, it's a generalized um, technology, okay? And it's going to affect human society. You know, you look at what it's going to do when we, when we have uh, Uber cars, for example, that have new people in them anymore, right? So it's going to have huge effects on society. And the technology of AI is moving on at a tremendous pace. Now, it's been around for a long time, but now we're at the sort of beginnings of the golden age of AI, and that's been driven by the availability of data and new computing power. You saw the GPUs that NVIDIA talked about and all the new capabilities, and also advances in mathematics, okay? And again, in the discussion that we had today, we, we've talked a lot about, a lot of people have talked about training data, cleaning data, supervised machine learning, but actually, and we saw the, the game of Go and various other things. But actually, what we've also seen recently was the uh, announcement, again from the DeepMind folks, about the game of Go being done again without any machine learning in, in a supervised sense, just putting two machines against each other with the rules of the game, and it got there. So really generalized machine learning yeah. without cleaning data sets. So we have, it's moving very, very, very quickly. Now, one of the things that we've got, the problems we've got in telcos at the moment is that our data is very siloed. That's one problem. S for siloed. Let's invent some letters. <laughs> Let's have some letters, shall we? You know, S for siloed, right? So what, what does that mean? Well, let me give you a use case, and I'll get to the data at your question. Um, I, I want to have a policy that says, you know, after five minutes, if there's a failure of the customer service, contact them. Something as simple as that. So imagine we're in this new world of SDN, NFE, with all these services going on and changing our network. Something's failed. We have to identify what the network failure is. We have to identify what services that are failed. And then we have to go up to the BSS layer and identify what customers are impacted by, what service instances are. And then we might say, well, let's go and check with the customer layer and see how these particular customers want to get contacted. 
One might want to get contacted by SMS, another one might be contacted by an email, another one might be a premium customer, and we want to get the account manager to write directly to them. So different ways that we want to, we want to connect. So what's holding it back? What's the data? The first problem is all this data is siloed. The next problem is all this data is different from one telco to another, different in its data model, different in the way it's accessed, different databases, different architectures. This is a big problem. Why is it a big problem? Well, because there's all these companies out there in the context that I set before, working in all the different areas of AI. And when they look at their particular business case, they're looking at the fastest route to revenue. Yeah? That's what you would look at, right? So if they do a medical application with their AI algorithm that spots cancer, they can take it to every one of the hospitals in the world, right? And they can sell it. It's a great route to market. Fantastic, right? If they do something in fintech, in the finance industry, they can take it to all the different banks. Great. You be a little AI company and think about going to AT&T. Just dealing with the complexity that we, we give these companies, right? The, the procurement, all the different things we go through. And then think about the fact that they've got to do an integration to the AT&T systems of data and everything else. And that's just to get the data. And then they've got to send messages to the network to do something. And that's all custom as well. And then they want to take the same application and do it for, say, Verizon or somebody else. You know. China Telecom, whoever it is. And it's all different again. So they've got the same algorithm, but they've got to now connect it, do the integration, start again, have another way of connecting it, the next one again. And this becomes a, not an easy route to get to market. So one of the things that we've thought about in the forum is standardize it. First thing is having a, a, having a, a holistic data model. So in the new ODA architecture, I had the honor to help you know, with, the, with the paper, with Barry, with co-writing it and it's going on in the other room. You see there's a, one of the things we're talking about now is having this unified data architecture. And it's gonna be some sort of pub subscribe data architecture. And it's really important that we create this data architecture now. Now, my analogy for this, I'm going on a bit, but my analogy for this is, you remember the HD ready TVs? You know, when it, when it first came out, HD? Imagine making, what we've got to do now, now, is to get our networks ready to adopt AI technologies. And to do that, one of the first things we have to do is to get this data stuff sorted out as an industry. And of course, if we develop the standards around those data models, how it's going to work, how the pub subscribe mechanisms and all, all of that stuff, that's going to make it much easier for, for, for the innovation from that community working in all different layers of the network. And then we've got to work on this intent messages. And intent is the way that we can pass the information from the AI system to the network, to the different layers of, of the operating system. Now, there are, three, there are three application areas that we've identified in the forum where we think there is really scope for, um, and we've only talked about one of them mainly in the whole of today that I've said, uh, and that's CX, custom experience. We've been focused very closely on, it's very important, I don't, don't, don't but there's, there's, that's one area, and it's the most developed. Do you know why it's the most developed? Because it's available for all industries. It's an easy route, just think about it, it's an easy route to revenue for the AI companies, and, the, and it's the, basically the same everywhere. So I'd like, you know. I'd like Doran to, you know, to, Doran to come back on this because obviously you have been doing this with Smart, you know, you just show, you showcased on this. So how hard was it for you to, to really you know, launch those services? And with great results, seeing they're reducing their churn. So how difficult was it to, to get it up and running? And, and, and is it a great challenge for vendors as well as you know service providers? I think so. I, I see things slightly differently to Brian, which is. Um, Yes, the, the, the capabilities of the technology is, is more broadly available today. I also think that service providers are realizing that they're looking over their shoulder at the over-the-top providers. They're seeing some of the great capabilities that they're leveraging to make things as easy as possible for their customers. And they're realizing, actually, there's, there's a very little barrier to entry to, to embrace things like chatbots. And yeah. chatbots is a tricky one because the vast majority of chatbots in the market today are, are fairly uh, simplistic bots. I think in the past year alone, we've seen huge advance, advancements in AI, real AI-based bots. But anyway, you know, things like bots and leveraging AI within the, the contact center, using things like machine learning KPIs for agents in the call center, I think the, the, it's actually relatively easy to deploy. I also think adding to the mix domain expertise is critical as well, critical to ensure success. It's, it's one thing, like you mentioned, going to a, a startup business who has these great capabilities, but actually understanding how to inject intelligence into each of these different business areas, what role that will play. 
Um, so having specific expertise in, in these domains is, is a critical to understanding uh, the, the success that you'll get from it. Um, so I think there's, there's more understanding and, and bots, for example, are pervasive everywhere. So marketing customer care departments are, are aware of, of them just by reading articles online, are aware of, of the concept of lookalike modeling, like Amazon do so well, so successfully. This concept of uh, predictive models and being able to predict uh, customers' future uh, intent, future purchase uh, purchases as well. So I think there's more understanding in the market of that. And I think that's probably why. I wouldn't dispute that, but there were other areas as well. I mean, yeah. just uh, about... I think it was about three or four weeks ago, we had AT&T at the SDN World Forum talking about the need for brutal automation. They used the word brutal automation. And all the way through the conference, everybody said brutal automation after AT&T said it. A bit scary, because I don't really like brutal things, but you know. <laughs> but because um, when you think about the effects on people and everything. But the other areas that um, we haven't talked about, right, and I don't require customer experience, but it's things like the network. So remember that we only have an OSS and a BSS because we've got a network. It didn't go the other way around. You know, we, we, we got them to simplify the network, the, the operations of the network and the cost and all those things. And it's the network services that CSPs deliver. That's the core of everything. And we're going to evolve that. SDN NFV is a big industry-wide transformation. But it actually increases complexity. And one of the things that we need to build in is the automation for SDN and NFV. And actually, in that space, there are very few firms working. There's another layer above that, which is service. You know, Amdocs do a lot of work in the service side as well. And there's all this business about service automation, you know, making sure that we get the right SLAs. You remember today we were watching, we were listening to that guy and the sound went away? An AI system should be picking up on that and optimizing the service so we get the right service that we've actually delivered. We don't want that experience. That's, that's not a good experience, especially when we've got a lot of people in this room. So we need, we need to work on that as an industry to deliver the right experience. And then we've got the customer experience layer. Now, there are some companies, when you're looking at where we are with AI, by the way, in the telecoms world, um, I use one company as an example because it's just a very good example, and that's um, the company called Dark Trace which is a UK company, and um, won the third best startup of all companies in the UK recently uh, in the Sunday Times, which is one of our big papers. And um, that's predicted to be one of the first 50 billion startups in Europe, growing at about 600%, only two years old, and working in the, using unsupervised machine learning in the area of networks, of, of evaluating the, the, the heuristics of networks. So we, we as an industry have got a lot of things to fix, and customer experience is really, really important, right? But if we, co if we can't deliver the transformational network and services, it's not going to, you know, if I lose my broadband, if they got all the other nice customer experience stuff, if you can't get, me, get that back for me in a reasonable time, well, yeah, yeah I see some dots. I'm going to go somewhere else, right? However good it is, you know, deliver me my service the way I want it. The performance of my broadband is, sucks at certain times in the day. I'm not going to be happy with that. So these areas of, we've identified these key areas of um, network, of service, where we need more work as an industry, and to bring in the innovation in those spaces as well as in the CX space. And Setu, where do you think the real opportunities are? What kind of work are you doing here for so AI? Specifically with Nielsen, right? Uh, one of the things that, you know, customer experience is, is key part of it, and, you know, we help uh, telcos evaluate a lot of them. Uh, and in course of evaluation, you know, we do come across a few examples that was there, right? So one of the things that we worked with one of the telcos in Southeast Asia uh, was just looking at the network performance uh, through our panels. Uh, and you know, just out of curiosity, we ended up asking them, it's like, okay, how do you look at network performance and, and fix those issues before? Uh, and they said, they ended up mentioning that they look at the number of events that are coming through and those events fall down. Uh, that's how they figure it out. And then that kind of prompted our further discussions on that, which, which kind of realized to what you were saying is, hey, it's difficult with the data, because in a live network, I can't inject faults to see you know, how my uh, behavior would change. And that's, that's hard to do. Uh, so we kind of helped them out on making some suggestions of, hey, you know, how we would you change from looking at events uh, and go and look at time between events to really identify what faults uh, that were there. Uh, and, and companies are like, you know, even if, as of now, they have not adopted that solution, so they are slow to get there. But I think the movement is going in the right direction. And I think the, they're starting, like you pointed out, right? It's from the revenue portion, look at the customers per se, and then moving down uh, 
through their pipeline of saying, okay, let's look at the networks and, and talk about automation. So uh, they talk, but it's not there it's not yet. There yet. <laughs> yes. And Don, I've got a question for you. So, you know, we've, we've heard today, we've seen lots of other examples outside of telco about making new revenues and, you know, so the great insurance example and, and looking at what they were doing and then going into healthcare with that. Then we obviously had the fireside chat with me and, and True, and it was interesting to say, well, telcos don't need to innovate in AI. We can copy and, and go behind. What's your view on that? And do you think you know telcos are ready to innovate? Because for me, from my perspective, you know, as an analyst, is you know if we don't innovate now, we, we're going to miss the bus, right? You know, and yet again, that's another opportunity that telcos would have made. So, what are you seeing in terms of innovation? And you know, even your example, it's all about reducing churn. But what about getting new customers and getting people excited about new services that telcos can do? Exactly. Yeah, the analogy I use is the train has left the station, which I've, I've used numerous times in previous presentations. Absolutely. Um, it's not too late to innovate at all. Yeah, absolutely. You can look at uh, some of the more forward-thinking companies and copy them in some respect. Um, I, I, there was so much going on in the industry with consolidation, with this move to broaden the scope of products and portfolios, bring in media, TV, etc. Uh, I think service providers have to transform, and they will do. They certainly will do. There's huge opportunities to sell a much broader portfolio of solutions now, which is great for, for many service providers, and it will continue to happen in the next few years. So uh, I think when uh, eventually, when more and more mergers and acquisitions happen, uh, I think this will give uh, further opportunities for them. And Brian, what do you think the biggest prohibitor to this is? Because obviously it's not happening fast enough. No. It, it's interesting when you look at innovation. Um, I, I spoke recently, that I had the pleasure actually to do a keynote at the at Vodafone's Global Architecture Conference. And uh, we, got, we got a lot of fantastic feedback and a lot of discussions. And one of the discussions was around open source. You know, um, open source has been seen by many as a replacement for standards. I don't believe it is. I think it's an addition. We talked about that. But we talked about the innovation open source enables. It enables you to get your innovation speed. We talked about DevOps and open source in that context. To move your innovation speed. And one of the things that telcos have struggled with is their innovation speed. When you compare them, they talk about you know, Google and Facebook. and are we, are we anywhere near there? You know, it took us two years to get this latest service out. These people have done it in three weeks. Look what Geo did by redoing things in a new way, you know, breaking the mold about. We can't afford to be stuck where we are, can we? We can't afford to be stuck with that level of slow innovation. So the question is, can, can telcos do all this innovation internally? Is that the model? Well, it's not the model that the, a lot of the new industry is using. It's using an open innovation model, right? So my belief is it has to be an open, if we're gonna get the innovation speed up, let's just say it's an open innovation model. So what does that mean? That means collaborative innovation, right? It doesn't mean closed innovation. I think that collaborative innovation will always win, personally. Yeah. Personally believe that, right? So if we believe it's a collaborative model, we can do things inside the industry. But we haven't got the data scientists. We haven't got the experts in the particular space. And we're probably not going to get them. They've almost, they're like gold dust anyway. They're not just all in the big, in the big companies, actually. Uh, four of the, of, of the best internet startups, like DeepMind, for example, have come from the UK. There's been a, some big acquisitions recently. So the lots of little companies. DeepMind was only a little company. Demis Abbasas and the gate, they were a little company, right? just not long ago, and they were acquired by Google, a big guy, you know, but they were a little company. So there's lots of these little companies who've got data scientists, who've got great innovation, and they're working in different spaces. You get a CX company, NLP yeah. company, you get other people working on video, you get people working on network, there are a few. Some people working on service. I know a few companies working on service, like including Amdocs and others, right? And, and so that you get people working in these different dimensions. We've got to find a way to ingest that. If we really want to make this industry move forward, my, my contention, and you can discuss it, and I'll put that forward to you, is that we must, correct, we must open our arms to the AI innovators and allow those AI innovators to, be, to work with us. That's my belief, anyway, to work with us to, to generate the capabilities that we need in service, in network, and in, in, in CX as well. Mm. Um, and I don't, you know, it's big companies and small companies to bring in those innovators and to work with them to, to, to get the innovation. And that is the challenge. And I mentioned these barriers about you know, the way, the difficulty it is to do business with us. And the, I think the forum could help in that. We've, we've enabled a lot of companies to come together in Catalyst and in other things. We should expand that. We, we want to build with, together with our members. We're going to discuss that further uh, of AI strategy. We've, uh, some of the things I've talked about are in the document we're going to put out for members to look at in the next few months. 
And we're working in all in those areas. Where will our focus be? What do we need to do on the network? What do we need to do on the service? How do we develop the data architecture? What are we going to do about intent? And it's all about creating the platform first, getting our networks AI ready. What do we need to do in the next in a, to make it available for that? Rather than focusing on one particular you know piece of AI, create the a platform and create an industry. Uh, link between ecosystems, between the AI and the ecosystems and the telcos. That's what we would, in the form, we think we could, we could add great value to the industry with your help to start on that process. That's where we, we'd like to go. And so too, there's lots of different technologies out there, you know, as Brian just says. Look, so, you know, as a company, where do you get started? How do you, you know, if you're looking into AI and you want to become more intelligent, you know, how, how do you say, how do you get started? You know, who, who do you look at and, and which technologies do you want to implement? So, based on, you know, our talking to different companies in Southeast Asia, it actually starts from you know, who initiates that conversation. Uh, if it's from the CTO organization, the conversations are fairly different from a CEO organization. Again, you know, the amount of funding that you end up getting is, is completely different. And, and you know, it has been pointed out over and over again that it's, it's very revenue driven. Um, so I would say, you know, hey, you know, start small, even if it's uh, from the customer experience per se, you know, start small, start <coughs> collaborating to your earlier question in the morning, hey, you know, there are a lot of uh, startups out there, there's a good ecosystem of companies out there, start to collaborate, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that mindset that, you know, we need to invent everything internally needs to go away uh, and, and start working through, right? Uh, I'll say an example for image recognition, right? I can download what Google has done and deploy it right away, right? But can I download something that's been developed by Vodafone or something and, and start working? Never. You won't even know what they are doing internally. Yeah. And, and that becomes a challenge. It's, hey, start, start with the collaboration if you don't want to work with it. Uh, it's a low risk thing. There is not a lot of funding required, but you know, that would be the first step. And if that works, Go to the next step, right? Have your own people working on some of those things. I understand there's confidentiality with the data, there's privacy issues that they need to worry about, but that can be solved. You know, there are a lot of different ways to address it, but you know, have that plan uh, to go and say, okay, here's what we are going to do. And you know, startups is the best way to get started. You know, start small, look at your customer things. Once it starts bringing in the revenue, you know, use that to fund other activities in there. So just to add to that, so. <laughs> From a blueprint architecture perspective, without getting too technical, I think there's two approaches that you can take. I, I agree in some respect to starting small. I, I think there's, there's two options. One is you can look at point AI solutions for specific use cases, or you can develop, develop a more broader, more holistic approach, uh, a proper architecture that's more of a cross-domain uh, platform and build specific AI use cases on top. And the challenge with deploying individual fragmented AI solutions is that they're fragmented, is that yeah. sometime in the near future, those service providers are going to have to figure out a way to connect each of these disparate AI solutions Absolutely. together. If you take a broader, holistic approach, what ends up happening is that you can take data from, let's say, the marketing <coughs> domain from campaigns and use that to fine-tune the product catalog. You can take data from the network and leverage that within the contact center so they can preempt calls into the contact center when the network goes down or when Brian has issues with his broadband. So I, I see value in both. I think you absolutely have to take a short-term approach. Uh, you have to build a business case. But throughout the, the journey, I think you should look at a, a much broader uh, medium to long-term plan as well at the same yeah, time. I agree completely with that, actually. I think that the, the second one is harder to do. Yep. But my only contention is we need to do it for the industry. Mm. So if, what, if, if every telco takes the approach of building a platform and every one of them is different, mm. that's not gonna, I don't believe that's going to work. So somewhere we have to begin to define what is the structure? What is a common structure? What, how does this data layer work? And that would be really powerful for the industry to do that. And as I said, it's the data goes out from one piece and the intent comes in. So we've actually got to sort the intent out. There's very little understood about the intent. The intent is kind of the taxonomy of the messages, like a message contact customer with a list of customers. Or do you say, you know, do you say ring customer? Or what, what's the taxonomy of the messages you know, that you need to pass? If that's not standardized as well, then there's not a common language on the other side and you end up with another lot of SI. So we've got to kind of begin to define the future. People will build today, like you said, and unlikely so, individual things, but we don't know what we don't know. And we're going to want to connect systems together in the future to do that, what I described, that use case, for example, that spans the OSS you know, and the BSS and, and, and goes back in to contact customers and all the rest of it. So we want to make the, the first thing you have to get to is we need to have a common data architecture 
That's the decisions going on in the other room. ODA is talking all about that. The, it goes through with governance around it and security around that layer and how that's going to work. And building that is a great enabler, standardizing that for the future, standardizing the intent, building things now to get going, and, the, and I think being clear on these new domains that we're talking about in the forum, because we think the focus, and we, that's for discussion again, is you know, customer experience, which is including forward management and other things like that, service, which is about optimizing services. We just saw an example of why we need to optimize services and, and, and look at SLAs in networks, and we know we need to do that for business. We need a new context for that in the world of SDN, NFV, and, and all the rest of it, and flexible services and things like this and things moving around. And then we need the network one to optimize the network infrastructure to deliver, you know, to be the, to the resource management of the network infrastructure, basically, that we need to work on, and, and the fault management of that layer in the new context. Those are, the, those are three key areas. And then there's areas, I think, that we do not want to go to, because in a strategy, you have to know, and I would say, the HR systems would be one. So my example would be that HR is really important to telcos, and there could be discussions in that dimension. But the TM Forum's focus has been on OSS and BSS and the network and the, and the billing systems and everything else. And we have to decide where we want to focus initially. And uh, so this is all for discussion, by the way. None of what I'm saying is in stone, and it's just a view. But it's, it's the start of the debate. You know, where is our focus in the forum? What are we going to do first? Is this really important that working in the data side would help the industry? You know, is this the right way to talk about the future towards a platform? And uh, then if we do that, and, I had, and certainly we're getting great feedback from the CSPs we've been talking to initially with some of these ideas, then, uh, then we take it forward to some action in the next few months. And my final question, Lauren, just to bring it back, is, you know, I've had, I've had a very great opportunity to, with Aya to play with her at Mobile Congress and see what it does. So what is the future for her? You know, at the moment she's doing, I mean, it's great, it's intelligent, and it's doing lots of things that we know about bundling, adding new services, but what do you see the future of where that product can go? And, and is there anything new and exciting you think that with AI can really enable the service providers and that, you know, that customer centricity piece? At the moment it's just really reducing, you know, call center contact. Is, is, there, a, is there a new area you're going to really focus on pushing? Well, I was reading recently that Gartner believe that 85% uh, of, uh, of customer interactions will be with machines, not with humans. I think we'll end up having more conversations with chatbots or virtual agents than we'll have with our wives or husbands, which is quite shocking. But it goes to show that machines are really at the front and center of every aspect of customer engagement. Being able to predict uh, future patterns, customer patterns, um, fraud management you talked about as well. You know, and this is a key area. Uh, billions of dollars are lost every year. So being able to detect anomalies uh, through patterns in network traffic, uh, which is you know, it's coming to fruition now. It's not too far in the future. Um, so I think there's a number of different areas that will be addressed over the few years. I think it's, it's a very, very exciting future. We just need to start it now. And Zetu, finally, you get the final word. What do you think the future is of AI, particularly for telcos? Uh, do you think it's, it's bright? Uh, it's bright, but you know, I guess the mindset <laughs> is, a, is a key one. Um, you know, looking at it more from an outside perspective, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, all interactions with them is like, hey, you know, there's so many issues, privacy is concerns, and you know, I can't take this. Uh, working on with them with different projects is is a year-long task, right. uh, that, that, rather than something looking at from a very short perspective. So, I guess once they stop, like, you know, once they start taking some risk onto it, I guess you know, they can. There's there's a lot of things that that can be done, can that can be adapted from different domains onto the telco uh, areas. Great, well thank you very much. Round of applause for the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>